My name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. I'd like to welcome you to the Asia Center's Research Talk Series, which is part of a new series of virtual programming at the Asia Center. The research talks are aimed at showcasing some of the fascinating research that's being done on various facets of Asia by Harvard students, graduate students, faculty, Asia Center affiliates, and other specialists. We very much hope you enjoyed learning from these talks. What do you think of when you hear the words Chinese medicine? Likely something like this, acupuncture, or maybe this, herbal medicine. This is what I thought growing up hearing stories about my grandmother as a Chinese medicine practitioner. But what about this? The first time I saw this, I was baffled. What was I looking at? So this is ear acupuncture, and more specifically, these five needles in these exact points is a particular treatment largely used for anxiety, stress, addiction, and behavioral health conditions. My previous video covers how this protocol was surprisingly developed out of the South Bronx in the 1970s at a place called the Lincoln Detox Center. Early forms of it began with revolutionaries such as Dr. Mutulu Shakur, a member of the Republic of New Africa who worked with the Black Panther Party, and others part of the Young Lords, another revolutionary group. In 1985, the treatment was given the name the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association Protocol, or the NADA Protocol for short, by Michael Smith, then director of Lincoln. Yet, is it correct to say that this five-point protocol originated at Lincoln? Does it originate with Smith, who gave it a name and completed the five points? Or with the revolutionaries like Dr. Shakur, who put in the first points of the protocol? Or with the research that the revolutionaries read about with a Bangkok doctor and Hong Kong doctor that discovered how stimulating points in the ears helps with withdrawal? Or does it go back to France, where a physician named Paul Noget sparked a global interest in ear acupuncture in the mid-1950s? Or does it go back to China, where Noget had gotten a lot of his inspiration and texts from hundreds of years ago and even thousands include putting needles in the ear? It's hard to say, and origin stories are hard to pinpoint, but instead of trying to figure out the start and end points, I want to look at the connections and transmission of the practice and knowledge. Just like acupuncture, the way to understand the following stories is to look at the unexpected connections. Connections between 70s revolutionaries in New York to present-day prisoners in England, from those in recovery clinics in Hungary to police officers in India, and even first responders on Ground Zero post 9-11. When I first saw those five points, I thought, how can just five points in the ears be effective? But then I learned I was asking the wrong question. I should have asked, what wasn't I looking at? I realized that it was what I wasn't seeing that mattered tremendously. How the treatment was administered, in what context, and by whom. I learned that what we see is often not the full picture, and even things that look the same often aren't. Where I learned of the NADA protocol in the US and later in the United Kingdom, I also learned of other forms of five-point ear acupuncture treatments, such as the SMART UK protocol. To understand the differences and similarities, I spoke to different practitioners. Here is Elizabeth Ropp, a community acupuncturist and not a practitioner, who first introduced me to the protocol at a New Hampshire recovery center on how the protocol works in her experience. I think it's not so much what it does, it's just what it allows your body to happen. And so when I put the needles in someone's ears and see, like, and hear them just suddenly take a deep breath, I'll put some pins in and then I hear the, the deep breath. Like their energy's dispersed. It's allowing everything to come back together, recharge their batteries and um, almost press the pause button for a really long time. And it, like a reset. People were telling me that they felt better in ways that I didn't expect. And I'm, again, limiting myself more and more to just the five points in the ear. And people are saying, my migraine's gone, you know, like, or like, hey, I was really nauseous and now I'm not, or my body aches are gone. Um, when my friend invited me to practice, to offer treatments at this respite shelter, it was a shelter basically for people to wait for open beds and recovery programs and they didn't really have anything to offer people who were going through withdrawal. I just gave everyone seed treatments and I treated this um, young trans woman who said, my body aches are gone, my headache is gone, I'm not nauseous anymore, what did you just do? So like that was a great story. because At the time I said, I don't know if I believe in seeds, but I know this won't hurt anybody and I can teach, I can teach you to do it, I can teach the whole staff to do it, you don't need a license, so let's just try it. And he said, and then I would show up once a week to keep doing treatments and keep reminding people. 
And he said, you know, the nights that you come and do treatments, we know that you've been here because it's so much quieter, everyone's more relaxed, everyone sleeps better. Laura Cooley, also an acupuncturist and not a practitioner, explains that it's not just about the five points, but everything behind it in what she calls the style of engagement. So there's a basic attitude of non-judgmentalness towards the individual. There's a basic attitude of understanding that society's ills are resting upon these people that are in despair. So the style of engagement, it's both your attitude towards the person. Um, you don't get in their business. It's not your job to talk to them about their process. You know, we say in the treatment room, you're chilling, you're being with yourself. Something comes up, that's to take to your counselor. That's not for the practitioner to be discussing at that time. Another style of engagement. You're expected, if you're working with a population, you're expected to understand their culture, you know, to do your homework. Nada starts from a compassionate place of understanding society's influences on how people's lives go. Under that compassion is we assume that the patient or the person we're serving has intu intuition and intelligence. And again, intuition, trauma divorces us from our instincts. So part of our job is reconnecting a person's instincts, holding hope for people who don't have it, right? Your job is to hold hope and be optimistic about a person's future when they aren't, because they have a lot of experiences telling them there's not much hope. So, you know, you're to hold the space that says, no, there is hope. You can recover. And what they do to recover, they've done it. You know, we have a tool bag, we can assist, but their recovery was done on their own steam. We say the person is the expert on their own experience. Like that's a basic attitude we'd like you to have. They are the expert on their experience. We as the professional, we might have a lot of good ideas, we might have very accurate diagnosis, but if they don't feel it from the inside, you know, us telling them does nothing. As the person that's serving people, when they make progress, it's theirs. We don't take ownership of it because what's empowering is the idea that they have the power to do that. Our basic job is to empower people and create resilience. That's our job. And that happens the quickest if you follow their lead, that you help them reconnect with their strengths and their instincts. That is the fastest road there. This treatment is like a reset button, allowing patients to take a moment to pause. Furthermore, where both Elizabeth and Laura are licensed acupuncturists and can put needles in other points on the body, they find that the majority of patients respond well to the simple five points. This simplicity allows the practice to spread widely, with people being able to train only in how to do the five points instead of going to traditional acupuncture school. This makes the treatment more accessible to all kinds of communities, especially marginalized communities that might not have had access to acupuncture before. Most of all, the hope of practitioners like Laura and Elizabeth is to empower communities. So what communities is the protocol in? Where has it gone? In Texas, at the heart of Texas, Waco State Agency, we had a program there that um, that in order to get into that program there, you had to have been institutionalized for five years of your life. Um, the Atlanta chapter of sickle cell anemia trained the people in the chapter to do themselves. Hungary has integrated it into every detox unit in the country. Um, it's gone all over the world. It's all over Eastern Europe. There were trainers in Saudi Arabia like 40 years ago or 35 years ago. So it's gone all over the world. Um, it's being used in so many different situations, anything related to trauma, um, job core programs for youth at risk, at risk youth programs in Mexico City with homeless kids, uh, rape crisis centers. <laughs> in India, our colleague Sunil, he started a program on the seventh floor of the New Delhi Police Department with the cooperation of the police department. Wendy Henry was at ground zero. She managed to get through three levels of security into the trailer. I should check it. I think it was the FEMA trailer because there were several trailers there. But Wendy Henry managed to get into the trailer at Ground Zero and do ear treatments on firefighters there. Um, they would stop to take a break to get water. Um, they did not want to take all their gear off. So with this treatment, they could sit in chairs and get ear acupuncture, get restored, and go back out there their own goals. So we also went after Katrina and worked with the Louisiana firefighters 
and with the, um, the peer counselors for the first responders because we, and particularly Wendy, had been working with the search and rescue teams. We go to their trainings, get the training, and on breaks we needle people. So they offered us their training for free, and then we give them services. So Wendy managed to get into the disaster zone during the disaster. This is first aid. This is psychological first aid. It should be in everybody's medicine cabinet. I see it as leading the way to a holistic process. It's first aid. It's like, that's it. It's first aid. This is a list that Laura compiled of all the various places that your acupuncture protocol is used in, almost as a first aid measure, as Laura and Elizabeth just mentioned. I call this concept toolkit care, a self-assembled, essential, mobile, community-based care, often in response to dire situations, whether it's emergency situations such as 9-11 or the ills of poverty and marginalization. And there's a DIY spirit to this toolkit care. Ear acupuncture has gone all around the world in the toolkits of various practitioners, and my journey led me to the United Kingdom next, where I had learned the five-point ear acupuncture protocol was being widely used for addiction, and it was brought over by practitioners who visited Lincoln Detox in the mid-1980s to 1990s. There are at least 20,000 practitioners that know the protocol in the United Kingdom, and what I found most remarkable was that so many of them were patients first. I talked to a number of patient-turned-practitioners, including Tim, who began ear acupuncture treatment in 1999 at a charity ear acupuncture service called Pathways to Health. A few months later, he began to learn how to do ear acupuncture himself with a practitioner named John Tyndall, who had visited Lincoln Detox in the mid-1980s. Here is Tim's story. I had some addiction issues myself, kind of how I started with it. Then I just felt like my willpower was weak, and that's when I started having the acupuncture. You know, I was actually waiting outside some of these first bulge books, and I just had this eureka, I've had enough of this, I've had enough of this, you know, I just want some change, I, want, I want, just want to move away from all that. And that was when I uh, went and had my first treatment. So yeah, it was quite life-changing for me. Uh, at the time, Pathways were doing two clinics a week, so I kept that up. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't sure at first. I knew, I knew I quite liked it. And after about six or eight weeks, going twice a week, I got up one morning, I looked in the mirror, and I thought, wow, you're a different person. Something's changed, something's moved. It just felt, just felt completely different, really. It just felt more, more in control of myself and more, I don't know, more grounded. I think, yeah, it was after I'd done about eight weeks of the acupuncture and they could tell it was working for me and I was coming to every clinic. There was this lady who suggested that I, I, I could work the pathways and someone suggested I went and did the course. It was only the NADA to start with. And uh, yeah, I did my two day course with John and as we always do, we did Qigong with him. And from then, my life oh, completely changed. Yeah, so it, it was quite a turnaround for me. When I first started going for the acupuncture, I was smoking a lot of cigarettes. I hadn't even really thought about cutting down. And I think about the, about this after about six weeks, so I looked at my packet of tobacco, and I thought, I bought that about a week ago. I, know, I was just smoking a lot, lot less, and I hadn't actually made any, any conscious efforts. It, it just sort of happened. I think you just become more aware of what you're doing to your body, massage, exercise, diet, just just sort of being nice to yourself. Uh, and I quite like about the fact when I'm treating people, I, I don't always know why they're in, whether they've got a major crack cocaine problem or whether they just eat too many biscuits or whether they've just got work-related stress or you, you don't really know. You don't really have to know either. I mean, that, that was one of the, the and part of the beauty of it is that you can give acupuncture to people who are not in the kind of social group. I see an acupuncture is when it's like 40, 50 pounds an hour. Um, it's not something that everyone has really got access to. Uh, so just being able to treat people from paying like no, two pounds or whatever, it, it, it's brilliant. Like Tim said, one of the things about ear acupuncture that he loved was that it was so accessible by all kinds of people. This is how he was able to try it. And this is how the next practitioner I spoke to was also able to try it. Liam was also trained by John Tyndall and his path to acupuncture began with his recovery from alcoholism. He's originally from a small coastal town of Scotland and here is his story. But I decided in my 30s that I had to get out of here, you know, cause alcoholism is a big thing. And I saw that's the way my journey was going. So I came to London and got even more heavily into drugs. I had put my 
myself into rehab for something like 360 days of the year they offered ear acupuncture amazing yeah absolutely amazing i just lived around the corner from the place so i just used to nip up there on saturdays and sundays there was a woman there who used to administer the acupuncture she said to me i know just the man for you you know it was john and then one day i was having a went in for treatment it was in an ear acupuncture course on this would be just about 2001 or something and he said yeah you, you fancy it you can have it for free and i thought yeah okay I just like the idea of spinning needles and of course being a working class kid i end up just treating poor people and that's basically who i treat i come from a strong working class background i've been a uh, I don't know what they call them in America, but they call them shop stewards here. People who support workers in factories. Right, so they come to me if there's any trouble, or the management come to me. I never felt comfortable with wealthy people treating them. I've tried it a few times. It doesn't suit me, so I tend to... So I, I never ever make any money at acupuncture, because the people like come and see me never have any. <laughs> so there's times I've really tried to walk away from it, but I just can't do it. I cannot do it. I want to help. I want to be part of any kind of solution. But acupuncture is just so amazing. Just you see such amazing things happen with it. It's just, yeah, amazing. People getting well. So I was still using needles. I always love that. It makes me tickles me a pink and makes me laugh. Yeah, so I'm not using syringes. I'm using acupuncture needles, but I'm still using needles. During my research in the United Kingdom, I also met Sue Cox, the director of SMART UK, which stands for Substance Misuse Acupuncture Register and Training. Her recovery process from her struggles with addiction at a young age had led her to acupuncture, not just ear acupuncture, but full body acupuncture, as she lived near and later attended a Chinese medicine school. She visited Lincoln in the early 90s to learn more about ear acupuncture for addiction, but strongly believed that it was crucial to explain everything with both Western science and Chinese medicine. The NADA organizations, especially in the 90s, had been split on the importance of explaining acupuncture in scientific terms. So Sue decided to create her own program, which combines Western science and Chinese medicine, as she wanted to remove the mysticism around the treatment, which she believed was harming its reputation. Thus, while the Smart UK protocol is also the five-point ear acupuncture treatment, it is distinct because of how it's taught. Sue is extremely passionate about helping people with addiction, and her ear acupuncture program focuses on explaining in depth the complexities of addiction, and she only teaches people who have backgrounds in the addiction field. She explains that ear acupuncture helps with balancing chemicals in the brain and stimulates the vagus nerve, but emphasizes that ear acupuncture is part of a much larger holistic process for a person's recovery. Her program has gone all around the United Kingdom and even into 128 of the 150 prisons in the country, where she teaches prison officers how to treat inmates with acupuncture, and she even teaches acupressure to the inmates with all the same theory. She attributes the success of her program to the strong focus on explanation and research. We teach, we do teach Chinese medical theories. So the yin yang theory, the five element theory, I teach them so that they can start to look at themselves in a different light and to get some understanding of being part of the universe as equally important part of the universe and that all of these things that change the seasons and everything are happening to them too. So it's a simplified way. Then we look at the brain in depth because it is the target, or target organ of addiction. When we're doing this treatment, it's wrong to call it a detox treatment. Livers detox, ears don't detox, it's nonsense. We teach um, the, about the brain, we marry the two together. So it's a, a lot about translation. It's about translating Chinese medicine into science and then into language that we all speak. So not keeping the elitism of, say, of using terminology that they don't know about, not baffling them with a great deal of physics, but translating it all and putting it together makes sense to them. They're not stupid people. It's more of a collaborative process with, you know, we're doing this together. So I do teach the, the background of ear acupuncture. I tell them about my time in New York. I, I now t emphasize quite a lot about the Black Panther movement and the Young Lords. I think that's a really important part of history. Uh, then I tell them how we came into being and what we feel about it. So there are so many differences far too many but I do talk to them about which part of the brain serotonin is manufactured in what part of the brain the ear, stim ear points stimulate why we think there is endorphin production so I tell them the whys of it 
And then if I'm teaching the acupuncture, I teach them practical skills, health and safety and the boundaries. They've got an ethical code, something that they have to adhere to. Um, we give them an exam. Then they go on a register. They have annual supervision. And it's become like a community of like-minded people, uh, all trying to do things the best they can. And they still write to me and say, gosh, I had this man came in today and he's told me that this has happened, that's happened, the other's happened. And I'm still thrilled to pieces about it but I also know why it's happening, and so do they. I think anybody can learn to stick a few needles in ears. I taught my grandson to do that, in rubber ears actually, but that's not the issue. The issue is understanding why you're doing it. Otherwise, it's a bit like anybody can stick a hypodermic and give somebody an antibiotic injection, but unless you know what you're doing, you might do more harm than good. So it is more to me about understanding it. You know, all of the anecdotal things, I mean, I've got thousands of those, thousands. And you could go on doing that, but you're never going to be able to replicate that and evaluate it properly if you don't really know what's going on. It's the way forward, and that's why it's worked so well here. It's the most unlikely thing to go into a utilitarian, harsh environment like a prison and take in this fluffy, touchy-feely world of acupuncture. It's, it's been remarkable to be able to gel the two together. I mean, the prison that you saw is one thing, but that's a very, very mild uh, experience. I mean, if you were to were to go into some of the higher category prisons, then it's very different. And to consider psychopaths with two personality disorders who are in for life, ask for acupuncture treatment, but not only that, they ask why it works. They want to know what's happening to their brain and they understand it and they welcome it and they embrace it because they're having it explained to them. I've had some amazing stories, loads of life-changing things, but not because, just because they had a few needles in their ears. Starts off the process, but then it gave them the ability to work. I often say it's a bit like fuel. You've got a long journey to go on, you've got a lot of hurdles to go over. You're going to need to be able to have some fuel in order to maintain that journey. I've got a patient who's epileptic, but, but her epilepsy is anxiety induced so she has a fit because she gets anxious so she has had quite a lot of ear acupuncture she's had other stuff but she has ear acupuncture and she's found that she has fewer a lot fewer fits now the ear acupuncture isn't fixing the it's not curing the fits it's reducing the anxiety which is then not allowed so you know it's understanding that but you know that if you don't understand it people put needles in ears epileptic fits stop magic wave a magic wand this stuff cures epilepsy not true you've got to understand it it's like blood pressure it's perceived that the treatment will lower high blood pressure which it will if it's caused by anxiety it won't lower low blood pressure and it won't lower normal blood pressure it will only lower blood pressure that's caused by anxiety You've got to understand how treatments work. And giving that information to patients actually empowers them because they will do all the right things because you've actually said to them, you're not saying, don't do this. You're saying, look, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. Also, over the years, people have said, what about diet? What about this? What? So we do teach a whole package. So we do talk about what kind of foods are good for the brain. We talk about smells and sounds and all of those things that you can improve your well-being by things that are just around you, um, which I think is also empowering. And also we talk about the importance of sleep. We talk about the importance of a dark room. In terms of how I see the ear acupuncture, I teach it as a very valuable adjunctive treatment, but not a magic bullet. The thing to me is, is to make sure that that man in the chair is being looked after that nobody is throwing a bit of parsley at him and saying, there you go, this hocus pocus magic will fix your uh, life-threatening condition. I don't think we'd get hardened prison officers who are very intelligent and very highly trained here in this country. You wouldn't get them doing a, a fluffy treatment. If it wasn't something that they could understand and relate to, they would just wouldn't do it. They don't do needles, no, but they know all the theory. They use the pressure points and they learn other points that they can use for, uh, just to use the seeds. They sign to say that they understand the, the, the limitations of what they're doing. Uh, they get a nice certificate and they want to do it properly so they don't abuse it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the men learn the reasoning behind it so they know why the acupuncture is being done in the prison and they're more liable to encourage their peers to access the acupuncture. They see themselves as a first aid, they see themselves as supporting the acupuncture 
trained staff, but they're more liable to be able to talk to their peers in their own language to get them into to the um, acupuncture program. I visited one of Sue's programs in a prison, and here were my field notes. In a rural town in the north of England, I sit with seven young offenders, as Sue tells us. We are all made of stardust. You are made of the same thing as the Prime Minister, as Albert Einstein, as Gandhi, and everyone else. The young men look at each other. Really? One of them asks out of disbelief? Yes, Sue replies. And anyone can be indicted. Addicts are creatures of excess. This sets us apart. Nature selected for addiction. It was a way of survival. The hunters and the gatherers who wanted more would be the ones that survived. Addiction isn't a weakness or an illness. It is a strength. However, addiction can kill, Sue goes on, and shows scans of brains damaged by substances. Some of the boys have never seen brain scans before. We continued with a detailed neurobiology lesson, down to the neurotransmitters being released into the synaptic cleft. Sue doesn't leave any detail out. Things like ear acupuncture or acupressure change the way of how you feel, and it helps you gain back control. It can empower you, and it gives you fuel. Sue says as she begins a lesson in Chinese medicine, which she describes as metaphors rather than literal natural forces. Yin and yang represent the importance of balance in the universe and in ourselves. It is possible to find balance, retrain the brain, and redirect the addiction towards something positive. I finished my journey by doing an ear acupuncture training myself with John Tyndall, who had trained Liam and Tim. I wondered who was going to be there and how was I going to learn ear acupuncture in four days? It was deeply intense with so much practice and needling other people's ears and getting my own ears needled. There were so many differences between this training and what I had witnessed in the prison with Sue. Here the focus was on practice, practice, practice. We would learn much more than just the five points and learned upwards of 50 points in the ears. But what stuck out to me the most was the camaraderie between me and 20 other strangers I had just met. People from all walks of life, math teachers, electricians, nurses, doctors. We came together to learn ear acupuncture in hopes of helping others. Not only that, we converged on each having chronic illnesses ourselves or having close ones who did. At the community training clinic on the second night, I remember observing trainees and patients interact. Patients with all kinds of conditions, sciatica, pancreatic cancer, anxiety, addiction. One fellow trainee asked if she can give me facial acupuncture. I never tried it before, so I agreed. People were quietly whispering to each other, catching up on their weeks or simply meditating. The space was comfortable, caring, and welcoming, accepting of whoever was there. It felt like a space held together by trust, of others and of oneself. But most of all, it felt empowering, because so many people that were there were trying to figure out how to pursue health together. That's when I deeply realize and feel that the five-point protocol, in whatever form it takes, is much more than just that. It is amazing to see how something developed in the South Bronx in the 70s has gone all around the world and changed the lives of so many. In turn, the treatment has also been shaped by the people. All the practitioners I met use and explain the practice differently, even if the treatment looks the same. This heterogeneity emphasizes how medical practices are really a reflection of us, our needs, and local contexts. There is no one form of ear acupuncture in specific and Chinese medicine in general. Medical practices constantly evolve. There is no real start point we can determine, nor even an end point. Yet, one key aspect remain constant in the unexpected connections, and the focus of all the practitioners I met with ear acupuncture in their toolkits was on empowering patients. These different practitioners are dedicated to serving patients, and especially those that are often disregarded and ignored by medical institutions and societies at large. As a result, echoes of the revolutionary spirit from Lincoln Detox continue to live on in the hands of these modern practitioners.